to welcome everybody uh, to this presentation, Thin Brick Manufacturing and Wall System Options. I am David Woods, and I'm the Commercial Sales Manager with Meridian Brick and Mason Reply. I am out of South Carolina. Um, like I say, I'm the Commercial Sales Manager. I cover um, South Carolina and uh, Eastern Georgia. And pretty much my duties are I call on architects um, and developers and owners in, that, in the state of South Carolina as well as Eastern Georgia, helping them through uh, decisions and different things for uh, designing buildings. And Thin Brick is under my bailiwick. So um, again, I want to welcome everybody for coming. Uh, this presentation will take uh, approximately between 50 and 55 minutes. I'll do my best to do a little bit better than that, uh, make sure everybody stays awake. Um, as Chris said in earlier, if you have questions, and you, you're more than welcome to type them into the text box. I'll do my best to answer them for you. Also, at the conclusion of this presentation, <clears throat> my contact information is going to be up on the screen with my email and phone. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me at any given time. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions for you and uh, help you through any challenges um, or questions that you have related to thin brick or any uh, brick um, questions. Also, if for some reason a question gets asked to me today that I cannot answer, I do have a lion's share of resources that I am able to get the answer required. So. If you answer a question or ask me a question today and I do not get an answer for you in my audio, I will respond back to you uh, via email and or phone call and get your questions answered. Before we get started, I wanted to take just one second um, and let everybody know this is an American Institute of Architect continuing education program. And I wanted, before I get into the specifics of the program, I want to just introduce Meridian Brick to you real quick, just to give you a kind of outline of what we do and who we are. Uh, we're the largest brick manufacturer in North America. We have an extensive brick line, uh, numerous plants throughout the southeast and heading west and north up into Canada. All our plants now have moved over to gas. We've had a couple coal-fired and sawmill plants, but those have since been converted over to natural gas, which is very environmentally friendly. And we also have one of the only lead gold brick plants in the United States. Um, moving apart from our manufacturing, we also have 31 distribution centers around the southeast is focused mainly. Um, we do move over into Texas as well. This allows us to also be a supplier and a resource for brick, thin brick, stone, stucco and east, any type of installation systems that we're going to be talking about today, as well as all the accessories needed for designs and or um, construction. So we're pretty much a one supply, we fit all. Now let's get into thin brick. Um, my learning objectives for you today is going to be we're going to just discuss kind of the benefits of the thin brick, when to use thin brick. We're going to touch base on some industry standards surrounding thin brick. I'm going to show you some different manufacturing processes. We're going to dig into some systems. And then we're going to dig a little, once we get into systems um, and when we start talking about some precast elements, we'll talk a little bit more in depth on a standard that kind of stands alone, which is the PCI standard which is applicable to thin brick. And then we'll look at and discuss a little bit on some aesthetic considerations when you're looking at thin brick, kind of a roadmap on the best direction to go when you're specifying thin brick. So let's get started. First, and I'm not gonna read these verbatim because you can actually see them on your screen, but thin brick has many benefits. Um, and the biggest one, which kind of moved thin brick into the uh, lion's share of, of some wall share as of recent, is its weight. It's very lightweight. It can be used in, you know, up in parapets, in different areas of your buildings where it, your design has not supported a full brick masonry weight, and you don't want to have to redesign and engineer it out and add a bunch of cost to your building. So thin brick has kind of stepped in, which gives it the same aesthetic look, but takes a lot of weight out your building and a lot of cost. Also, we're going to talk about some different benefits with it being easy to install. And, it, and the misnomer, and I get asked this a lot, is it really, is it brick? Yes, it is. It's clay. It is actually a brick. 
It's environmentally friendly because we use a lot less material, as much as 75% less material, which makes it a uh, you know a lot less material. And it goes and the materials currently that our plants have allows our mining to go a lot farther when we're using thin brick and manufacturing thin brick on a high level. Also, thin brick is very thin, so it allows you to add some insulation and um, some different things behind the wall cavity uh, without adding cost. And then seismic, we'll touch base on that a little bit. Um, that's really compl complacent to the design of the building, um, but there are some seismic considerations, especially where I am here in Charleston. Um, I have had to uh, dig into the weeds a little bit with our city officials as well as some of our designers and talking about how the seismic considerations and limitations applicable to brick versus the full veneer exterior. Now, where is thin brick used? Of course, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you see on advertising and different publications. It really took off first in the interior applications, you know, backsplashes and fireplaces and different accents inside of, of buildings and homes. Then it started moving outside into some of our outdoor um, living spaces, you know, porches and things and decks where people are putting fireplaces on it. So instead of, you know, bringing the support structure from the ground all the way up, it, it allowed you to add some thin brick to it without adding anything to the weight or the uh, substrate. And commercially, it's, um, it's also very friendly. And I'm showing you a picture down here of a Dick's Sporting Goods. Uh, we've partnered with Dick's now for about 10 years. <clears throat> what it's allowed us to do is in a lot of Dick's stores, there's a storefront on the exterior of a structure, and then there's an in, inside front, which you see here in like a mall setting. And what we've been able to do is we visited with Dick's, sat down and talked to them, and got a kind of a brick color spectrum picked. It allows us to use full brick on the outside of the buildings that are having to, you know, for that application and for that design but also to take the thin brick of the same brick to the interiors of the buildings. So what that allows it to do, it gives dicks a lot of flexibility. If it's a standalone dicks, they can use full brick. If it's a dicks where, like I just spoke about, the exterior of the mall is full brick and the interior of the mall is gonna be a thin brick application, it allows the brand consistency throughout. Um, dicks has pride itself on this. They were one of the first retailers that did this with us and um, we're still partnered and um, having a great relationship with them. We'll dig a little bit more on how the full brick and thin brick work together as we go. Um, some uses considerations like I've talked about before. Um, but one thing that um, sometimes is not understood is that thin brick can be used on a facade over 30 feet. You can climb as high as you um, design. Um, but you do have to consider what type of panelized construction or what type of application for installation you're going to use. Um, so those are kind of some conversations that need to start early in the design. If you want to make some climbs of 30 or 40 or 50 feet on a building, we need to look into a little bit of how, the, how a panelized structure will support the brick and support your design without adding cost. Also thin brick and renovations, you know, cladding's over foundations or you have buildings that are um, you know, a siding building or a stucco or east building that's had some age and had some work from the environment allows you to go in with thin brick and overclad it and uh, dress it up and without really doing anything to the exterior of the current building um, because stucco or east, um, you can simply remove the siding and use some dense glass and put some weatherproofing and install the thin brick right over it. So you're not at a lot of cost, you're really just dressing up the building from the outside. Now, real quick, we're going to look at some industry standards. <clears throat> a full brick anchored veneer, of course, a brick is three to half to three and five eighths inch thick. With that being said, you've got some wall ties, anchors, different support structures, angle lines that's going to have to support that brick. You also have an airspace behind the brick, between the brick and the wall cavity that allows any type of flashing weeks or any type of drainage. That's pretty much a standard brick installation. Then your thin brick, <clears throat> the unit's a half inch to one inch. And so what that does, you're, a, you're adhering that thin brick directly over a substrate. So the things you have to look at is if, it's a, if you're simply wrapping the building with a, with a 
with installing some type of drainage plan in that you can, or you can design it as a way with a system where it actually has a drainage plan built into it. But if the building's wrapped and watertight with a watertight barrier, install the thin brick right over it and put your drainage planes or wall plane system in there and you're ready to go. Looking at the specific standards of uh, manufacturing that we follow and we have to adhere to when we're manufacturing full brick is under the most popular one, which is the ASTM C216. Uh, there's also another one, which is ASTM C652, which is the hollow core standard. That one's coming to play a little bit as well, but for the most part, an ASTM C216 is probably what most of you guys are familiar with. For full brick, now looking at thin brick, you have a grading agency of ASTM C1088. And that follows all the different guidelines as well, which is follows under the fire clay units for a normal face dimension, which is not going to vary from the ASTM C216. What's going to be different though, as of course you're going to have reduction in your materials and the actual thickness of the material, which is going to affect the absorption, it's going to affect how it performs, but also it falls under an adhered veneer application, which ASTM C1088 is explicable towards that. Digging a little bit more, like I told you, the ASTM C216, there's 62.19 cubic inches of material. Look at the ASTM 1088 for thin brick is 10.72 cubic inches of material. That's an 80% savings of material. Big question though I've always asked is when you start digging in this a little bit deeper, people are like, okay, well, you're saving 80% of the material, but why is the thin brick still so expensive? You're taking out so much of that material, but compared to a conventional brick, it's, it's costly. And we'll see that here in a few minutes. Um, but you've got to look at the big picture. You've got to look at how the building designs. You're taking a lot of the uh, structure out of a building if you design it for thin brick. So with that being said, as a result, low cost. But in the same breath, it's a little bit tricky too on the manufacturing side. This material can be extruded, and this material also can be cut in different types of designs, which we're going to talk about how we manufacture it, and that tends to add some upfront cost to it. And uh, you'll understand that a little bit more once we dig here in a few more minutes. The brick classification, and this is pretty simple when you start digging into this. The FBS, FBX, and FBA are your normal grading agencies for conventional brick. Applicable to that is the TBS, TBX, and TBA, and those are specifically applicable for thin brick. Tolerances mainly on the faces fall in the same. As you can see, the FBS is a quarter inch. FBX, TBX is an eighth of an inch. And then FBA, TBA is really brick that don't really fall under those categories because that's usually used under a feel applied, um, almost like a DIY type of brick where aesthetics is more important versus the actual size and tolerances of the brick. And again, like I just touched the base on the size tolerances. Interior applications will be that FBA. Exterior field applied could be in the FBA, but it's probably under like a TBA. And then you've got a panelized application, the TBX, which is those are laid in panels and grids. And we'll dig into that here very shortly to show you some specifics on that and why that's so important. But TBX is really a tight tolerance and the systems that it brick works with doesn't have a lot of wiggle room. So these bricks have to be pretty tight on their tolerances when we manufacture them. Let's look at some processes real quick, like I talked about. This will give you some better understanding on when I was talking a few minutes ago on how the cost um, is affected when manufacturing thin brick. There's four basic types of how thin brick is manufactured. A split tile extrusion process, saw cut after firing process, which a lot of people are very familiar with. You're actually cutting the brick after it's been fired. Then extruding on a custom shape, and I'll talk about that. That's really applicable to the shaper caps on the actual machine when the material is extruded, which I'm gonna show you in just a second. 
And then the cut green process, which is really getting some legs under it um, because you're cutting the brick actually off of a full um, column. You're cutting the face with a wire, but what you're doing is the you're cutting the material before it's, it's fired, so which allows you to recycle that material. And we'll dig into that a little bit deeper uh, when I show you some pictures up here in just a second. This is an extrusion machine, and this covers a lot of different areas. Um, it's very simple. Um, it's very small, too, which makes it nice because what we do in a lot of brick plants and a lot of varying manufacturers, this specific machine goes in a normal brick plant. And the reason it's so compact is because it doesn't hold a lot of material, but it can process a lot of material. Also, all the materials that are used to manufacture thin brick also used to manufacture full brick, of course, in different quantities and different mixes and different things that go into making brick. But it allows this machine to be in there, partner with a full brick plant, actually extrude, extrude thin brick, and it's in a compact area, and all the materials can be moved in it in a very, very functional area. The raw material, as you can see on this arrow, goes right down in this box, and then it's pushed out the front. And I've given a good example of this. When we were all kids, the Play-Doh was a, was a, made a little toy that was very similar to this. You could put your Play-Doh in the top, and you can push it down, and it would screw different shapes coming out of the front of it. That's really how this machine is. It's very simple. A lot more. I make it. I'm playing it down to making it look very simple. But you know, there's a lot involved in the material that goes in it, of course. But how it's extruded and how it works is very similar to that. This is the machine actually in a plant setting. Uh, that that blue in the back is is where it shows. That's that extrusion machine that I just showed you. But what this shows on that left, where that tire is, that's a conveyor. And what it is, is that material is extruded out of the front, and then that conveyor and that tire keeps that column rolling on out. Of course, the column is a lot smaller because we're actually manufacturing thin brick versus the full column of a brick. What happens in a full brick, like if that, that was an extruder on a full brick manufacturing plant, that tire would be sitting up higher. It wouldn't be down as low as it is right there on that conveyor. And what it would do is when the huge brick columns are, are coming out of that machine, that tire is rolling actually the column on top to keep that material rolling. So what does it look like when it's being extruded? Here's a picture of it. And as you can see, this doesn't look like your conventional brick. You know something's up with it because it just doesn't fit the normal brick criteria a visual that you have in mind when you're looking at it. But what this does, it's extruded just like that. That shaper cap that I was showing you kind of on the end is where those holes come in it, and those holes are extruded um, horizontally versus vertically, like we do in a normal brick column, the way it's made. But what it allows you to do is after this is fired, you can break it, you can hit it with a hammer and bust that apart, and that brick comes right in half, and uh, then you've got two pieces out of that has the frogs, the grogs in the back, which allows the brick something to hold on to when that mortar is put in there. Um, so two ways this is done. We ship them out, like looks just like this, and the masons in the field can pop it with a masonry hammer in half. You do get some breakage, um, just like anything. Um, so and we offer as well, and not we being Meridian, but any brick manufacturer of thin brick, will offer the ability to cut these two and ship them and package them as in thin brick quantities. The positive about that is if you ship them in a full brick piece like this, you're falling under the same constraints and weights and quantities as a full brick, which you would ship, say, on an average, say, 10,000 brick on a truck. If you split these up and package them as a thin brick, you could ship as much as 30,000 on a truckload, which is, as you can see, the cost might be a little bit higher, but that's one applicable part of that that allows you to ship a lot more material for the same cost as you would ship a normal truck of brick, almost like three times. Here we go again. That's that picture of that conveyor. The tire is not, of course, in the picture, but those are extruded out. Those units could be – that could be a utility unit. As you, if you really have to look where that arrow is pointing, you see a fine line there. Those brick could be like an enormous size, which you know, like 11 and 5 eighths, two and a quarter inches high. Or we could make them in a utility size, which is like a three and a half inch height by 11 and 5 eighths length. 
So you can do all kinds of different shapes once you're coming out with those and still break them apart and still make them function just as a thin brick would in any size. Our next one is our saw cut after firing. Um, this, some people look at this as the dinosaur because what you're actually doing is you're cutting the face off the brick after it's been fired. And the extra material that is left over is discarded. And what all the brick manufacturers across the US and in Canada have been trying to do is find homes for the brick. What we'll do is crush it up and you know make brick bats or brick finds or something to be used in a landscape application. <clears throat> but what the specific need of this and the reason this will never disappear is because you could have a full brick manufacturing plant that does, the, does not have the capacity to use that machine that I showed you a few minutes ago to actually extrude the brick. So if they have an old plant or a plant that makes some very unique colored bricks, allows them to get in a thin brick market because what they'll do is they'll, cut, they'll just cut the faces off the brick and, and package and sell them as a thin brick. They can cut them in a flat where you see this dotted line across or you can make corners as well. The biggest bonus for this is what happens is, is you're designing a building and it's got full brick and it's got thin brick on it. Say you want the interior of the building to be thin brick <clears throat> and the exterior of building to be full brick. and You want the brick to look identical manufacture all the brick out in, in one big long run if it's 50,000 brick and you say 10,000 of it's got to be thin 10,000 of it we pulled out of, off the line taken over to the saws they will be cut packaged back up all together shipped to the job full in thin brick you can use them for any type of applications like I said earlier if it's a parapet up on a up on a roof line or any type of climbs that are designed in the building that don't support a full brick, thin brick can be applicable. Once they're installed, it'll uh, match exactly. Here's a picture real quick of the saw. It's a very large saw and most manufacturing plants have specific buildings aside off the plant location on the proper, but you know, away from the actual manufacturing plant where they cut this material. And these saws usually run 24-7. Picture of another type of brick. These are extruded. Um, this looks like a normal brick that you would see, but you can see the little curves that are cut in it. This gives you the flexibility to, you can pop them off, pop those little inserts out to make a thin brick. You can make a corner with it. Um, and again, they can be done in the field or they can be done at the plant location. Here's a green cutting process that I touched base on earlier. And as you can recall what I just said a few minutes ago, when we're cutting full brick into thin brick, and we have that extra material, we've really worked hard as a company and as an industry to find homes for that extra material that wasn't used. Um, this process, as you can see that there's a wire that's in inserted in there and that wire cuts that thin brick to whatever thickness it needs to be. As you can see in the front, that looks like a normal brick. It's exactly what it is. But what we do is when that piece is cut, it's extruded on out, and the rest of that material drops down and is turned around and it's recycled because it's essentially like Play-Doh or like clay. You can recycle it. Very environmentally friendly. And with this is an example of showing that green cut process. See the normal brick on the bottom um, being fired, and then you see the thin brick on the top. This will travel through the kiln just like any other brick would. Um, the advantage of this is that all the um, elements and environments that these brick are exposed to, the heat, moisture, all the things that the brick are exposed to in the kiln, the drying process, and the cooling process, the thin brick and the full brick are going through the same environmentally, um, same way, so they'll match and be exactly the same way, so there'll be no differences in the color. Very tricky, though, because different heat elements, as you know, that's the units on the bottom are a lot more clay versus the units on the top. Plants have put in a lot of time and effort and engineering to be able to manufacture a brick in this form so it does match. So when you're looking at thin brick, what's, what's the things you think about as a designer, as an architect, as an owner, as a homeowner? You want the color, size, and texture. You pick it just like anything else. Um, and like I talked about, matching the full brick and thin brick. 
How does it affect the, the environment, the lead times, the budgets, the wall system capabilities? Those are all very important parts of the thin brick production process. You as a designer and or as a homeowner or, or owners or developers, the things that you look at, of course, probably one, number one would be the budget. Where is this going to fall at? What's it going to cost me? And the colors, textures, and the sizes, that's really the, the two things you look at. The other things that you need to be advised of, and this is where your rep, um, either distributor rep and or manufacturer rep, when they're talking to you about thin brick, talking about how it can be manufactured. Can it be extruded, or is it going to have to be saw cut? Um, it, does the design have full brick and thin brick? And if it does, is, if I'm asking for it to be extruded, is there going to be a full brick that's going to match it, or do I have to go to the cut after firing process? So those type of things are very important. Environmentally, we produce, we produce evidence on that and, and documentation, so that's it, yes, it's important to the environment, but it's probably not as important to when you're actually choosing the materials that you're choosing. But with lead and things like that, it is important. Lead time very flexible as well because the beauty of cutting brick after it's fired, say you've got inventory out there on a manufacturer's yard and you pick a brick, but it has to be some thin brick. The brick has been sitting out there two years. You can still take it back in, cut it with a saw, and you've got your thin brick. Now wall systems. There's two type of wall systems we talk about. There's field applied and there's panelized construction. We're going to touch base first on the field applied. One thing that's critical though on field applied is a misnomer out there is, you, you know, in questions, not as much misnomer, but a question is, what do I use to adhere the thin brick to a substrate? Can it be just a type S mortar? Can it? Maybe on an interior application you might get by with it. I don't recommend it at all. I would use a polymer modified mortar. And what that does, that has some strength characteristics to that mortar that's added to it allows it to be resistant to any moisture if it sneaks behind the wall, even though you've got a dried in cavity in your substrate, everything's done right, moisture can still sneak in it somehow. And by putting a poly polymer modified mortar in it, it just gives you a lot better bond strength and it gives you a lot better feeling and you can put your head on the pillow at night knowing that this material is going to stay on the wall once it's installed. Breaking it down on the thin, set, scratch, and laugh. That's kind of a basic field applied. Um, this is a little diagram. It just shows, you know, your basics of your wall. And if you've been with East and Stucco, it probably looks very familiar. You got your sheeting, you got your building wrap, you got your drainage plane, you install your metal laugh, you got your scratch coat, thin bricks on it, grout your joints, and you're moving forward. And here's some pictures of it. You know, you're adding some exterior grade sheathing material, two layers of water resistant barrier, which could be like a Tyvek wrap um, and felt paper. Um, and then you're putting on your corrosion resistance lath, which is a basic um, lath that you'd use on any exterior application. Your fasteners as well. So none of this, you really reinvent the wheel um, on anything that, that an installer and or a designer would use say on a stone. Uh, which is not really prevalent down here in South Carolina, but I'm sure up in Canada and up those areas in the north, stone is used a lot. So if you designed a building for stone and you wanted to do that same building in another area or state, you don't change the design. Everything's essentially the same. All you're changing is the stone on one for exterior and you got thin brick on the other one. All the materials behind it are exactly the same. Here we go again. This is a thick set scratch and lap. So what you're doing, you're applying your coat. And just like the picture shows, you can use a type of NRS requirements under the ASTM C270. And then depends on what that, what that specific mortar meets to make sure it meets code. And then you scratch over the base coat, and then you're good to go. After that's done, and then here you go, just like looks very familiar if you've seen how bricks install your bed in the back of it. But your bed in the back of this, and you're setting into, into right over the last. Um, this picture shows these guys kind of freehand in it, which, you know, guys or girls, excuse me, but um, no spacers. So it's, you know, if you do it enough, it's very, very easy. 
But um, I've seen in the past people using spacers to make sure the brick look uniform and look very, um, very aesthetically pleasing. But you're applying it, sticking it on the wall, then you're coming, once it's cured out a little bit, you're coming behind it, you're pointing up the mortar joints, either with a mortar bag or you're feeding mortar in and tooling it, and you're ready to go. And here's a picture earlier where I talked about when you're going into buildings and using different types of claddings. Here's stone and brick used in the exactly same. This could be, an, say, a, a small retirement community. And in this area where you've got stone and brick, the stone being the bump out, the brick being behind it, great. If you want to go to the building directly behind it and have the brick as a bump out and the stone is the, is the brick, you can alternate them, move them around, do anything you want to them without changing any of the substrates. Here's another one of our partners, the Hilton Garden Inn. They use the East system with thin bricks on most of their Hilton Garden Inns. And what they do is, um, this is like a box design. And on this picture right here, where it shows, you know, I would say, what, 75, 25 brick versus stucco. Say on the next one, they wanted the predominance cladding to be east and the minority cladding to be brick, they can just switch it around. They can do anything to make it look different and not all of them look exactly the same. And on the bottom there, you can see that stone cladding that's added to it as well. It's also everything behind it is the same. The design is the same. You can take this building, build it four different times, changing things around, moving everything around with exterior materials really gives it some character. Changes the claddings, but you're not redesigning the building each time you do it. Thin set systems, same thing again. The only main difference in with this picture and the last one I showed you about the air water barriers, these are liquid applied air barriers and water barriers. And, put, and they're liquid applied over the cement board versus an exterior sheeting and, and a house wrap. And here we go. As you can see behind, there's a, like a CMU wall. He's applying the cement board using the screws that are manufactured, tape and sealing the joints. And then on that second picture, they're applying the liquid air and water barriers, cover the joints and make sure all the holes, everything's watertight. Mixing up the mortar. They use it in five gallon, five gallon buckets. Reason being is because you don't, you see this historically with mortar. A mason can go back out and retamp up the mortar, add some water to it. Uh, that works um, when you're using full brick masonry, but it's it's a struggle sometimes with them because it compromises the bonding strength of it. So you only want to mix it in small quantities, which allows you the workability to work with what you got, and you're not adding materials or or diminishing the strength of that material at all. You want to make sure it's going to perform as it's designed to perform. And as you can see, there's a scratch there, the scratch coat, and they're applying the thin brick to it again. Touching up the mortar, you know, putting the mortar in it, pointing them up and tooling it. When that building's cured out, you'll not be able to tell if that, looking from a distance of 20 feet, you wouldn't be able to tell if it's a full brick or a thin brick application. Here's an example of where they're cladding a masonry or CMU wall. Uh, this wall concrete backing there's the concrete board you can see the scratch and laugh on it not the laugh but the scratch coat excuse me and then the thin brick supplied and here's those spaces that I was talking about on this type of with this picture on this type of install uh, this gentleman and this female are applying a lot of material and it's critical that especially on that over spans to make it look as uniform and clean as possible so they're using those spaces which help and then here's where another popular one, uh, moving now off the conventional onto one of our quote unquote systems. This is a metal support system or popular characterized as called a tab system. This shows how you've got your sheeting, your building wrap, optional drainage plane, which I recommend. It's not really optional drainage plane installed. Then this metal lath system is installed and then your thin bricks put in and then your joints are grouted. We'll look real quick closer at how exactly that's done. There's different suppliers, as I put in here, of the of the system, but there is a popular one called Tabs, which is kind of cornered that name, and that's kind of been the 
name for this type of total system, regardless of the manufacturer, because there are different, different manufacturers that have tried to improve on this system, but it still follows really under the category of tabs. And just by that picture, you can see is that's a tab that a brick house we sit on. Brick are stuck right into those tabs. And this is a good example. This is a garage of a gentleman that um, didn't like the way it looked and he wanted to um, you know, dress it up a little bit. That's probably if he's, if he's like me, it's his home away from home is the garage, so he wants to make his garage look good. So what does he do? He uh, screwed on the tab system and then he's going in and he installed all the brick on it and he's going in and touching up the joints now. As you can see, there's some adhesive put behind it and then that brick is just popped in. Those tabs sit right to it. The tabs hold it, that adhesive holds it in place until you can come in and install your mortar. Another popular thing about this type of system, it's very fast. As you can see, those tabs are installed on that picture on the left. Um, someone or two to three guys, installers, could probably cover that area in a day. Put all those tabs in, have somebody coming right behind them and pointing up the joints and have somebody behind that tooling the joints. You can keep right on moving. Also allows you to put that over any type of existing structure as well. And here's a picture of it. Here's the before and after of the building. You can see the building look kind of aged. It had some stripes and some things going on. They did some repairs um, and versus going in and really adding some cost to the building. They said, you know what, we're going to dress it up with some brick. Um, so started talking about our tab system, went in and installed it, and building looks like a completely different building on the picture on the bottom. Just really dresses it up and uh, adds some value to the building for very little cost. Very important on any type of system that is in use, there's always got to be an area where you've got some flashing that needs to be on the bottom. This allows any moisture, as you know, can get in the can get in the wall cavity. There could be some moisture from interior of the building slowly working its way through any opening on the interior of the building when you've got some variances of temperature. And if it works its way out, it's got to go somewhere. So you've got to have some type of fl uh, flashing plane on the bottom that allow any kind of moisture that can get out from under there. Just a very good safeguard. This is kind of a breakdown of how this all works. You've got your system and your sheeting. It's just a quick picture of showing how it all works and comes together. Now, when you're talking about a brick lath on an exterior application, there's difference between exterior and interior. And there's been new systems now designed that actually work for that. This is not quote unquote a TAS system. This is more of a lath system. But you can see you've got your sheeting, you've got your exterior wrap which is the like house wrap is what I call it, and salt paper. And then you've got this brick lath system and your brick over the top. As you can see, he's installing it with uh, manufactured approved screws. He's spraying the polymer modified mortar in it. And what, that just makes it go a little bit faster. And you, of course, can do it with a trowel like this other picture on the right does. But um, I've seen, and actually some of these manufacturers that make these different systems manufacture and have copyrighted a specific type of sprayer. And it makes it move a lot quicker, and then you can come in and trowel it and move a lot faster. And then here we go. The mason and or tile installer is pushing the brick into that polymer modified mortar. He'll have a trowel in his hand to clean up those little areas so he can go back in. and tool up the joints. He's doing it by hand there. Like I say, you can do it like that. Or you can go in with a um, mortar bag, squeeze it in and tool it. And there you go. It's done. It's cleaned up, ready to go. Now let's talk real quick. Interior. System looks the same, but it's really not. Your whatever type of substrate you have on interior, you attach the panel. What this panel is, which is manufactured specifically for interior, it's got a sticky kind of rubbery coating on it, but it's covered in plastic wrap. You peel that off, and you're essentially it's sticking the brick right on there. It holds them in place. You're coming behind it. You're putting your mortar into joints and tooling it. The tricky part of this is, in most DIYs especially, 
uh, you got to clean it up somehow. So the cleaner job you do on the interiors with this type of system, the better, because you can't, like in the picture on the right, you can't go into a restaurant with, some, um, you know, a brick cleaner, uh, any type of acid-based brick cleaner, be cleaning up these panels for uh, getting those type of materials on the interior. So this also allows you to go in and dress up older buildings as well. But just do a clean job up front, and you won't be um, having to clean it too much. Now our panelized system. That was our, our second part of this. Um, in the panelized systems, there's different types, metal stud, wood stud panels, con cast in place concrete, and then some modular construction. So we're going to look at each of those real quick. Biggest thing on this picture that shows is a lot of the work with these type of systems, and that's exactly what it is. It's a system. So how is it moving into the market and how is it used? Well, a lot of the work is done behind the scenes before the panels are even manufactured. As you can see, the gentleman right there on the computer, he's designing it um, based off of that system, how that system's going to perform and how it's going to perform in that design. Once all that's done, then they prepare our shop drawings, and off to the races they go to start building the panels. And here's some components of it. Another big benefit of this type of construction is that it's 99% of the time done in a controlled environment inside of a large warehouse of some sort. So it can be done at any time or anywhere across the country, um, really sealed from the elements. But they've got, you see the metal studs there, and then they're putting the sheeting on it, and they're doing their waterproofing. And they're putting some mesh over it, whatever type of mesh or substrate they're going to use to adhere to what type of thin brick they want to use. You can see that long line of thin brick there applied. Um, it's all laid out. Um, I've seen it done with spacers. I've seen it done laid out just like that in these grids. These guys know how to do it as well as they do. And then they're going in, pointing them. All the mortar, you can see it's all pointed and kind of a finished product there on the right. But those are huge panels. Then how do the panels get in there? you got to be delivered on a job site and got to have a crane there. And uh, There's been some um, that these guys could manpower themselves if they're a little bit smaller. But in the most part, especially with metal stud panels, they're brought in on an 18-wheeler, picked up with a crane, set in place, um, supported up, and you're off to the races. Here's some pictures of how this works together. As you can see, um, you've got some, you know, different different brick colors up top. It looks just like a conventional brick job. And when you rode by it and glanced up at it, and then you did not know, you could not tell if it was a standard brick or if it was a thin brick. Here's some other pictures of these type of panels. And the beauty of it is, like in this panel here, you've got your GFRC. Um, up there on your like the wainscoting on your roof and you've got some dressings over your windows Everything's ready to go the panel it looks like a wall sitting there ready to find a home It's got your windows in it. It's everything there. It's ready to go The Back of it as you can see has all the supports there where you can attach your wall systems moving forward So it's a uh, it's just a great fix Precast concrete and there's you have to talk about, when you talk about cast in place panels, there's two types, the precast concrete, and then you've got your tilt up concrete panels. And if you didn't know better, you would look at them and say, well, they're essentially the same. Well, they're not. Uh, tilt up is just like it sounds. Tilt up concrete panels are manufactured on location. They're built at the job sites, and then they're just essentially tilted up in place, and then you start your construction. The cast in place, the precast concrete ones, those are done off site and moved and delivered just like I did, like I showed in the steel panel ones. They're delivered um, on a crane through a truck. There's advantages um, and disadvantages. Mainly the disadvantages for the tilt up is that one, tilt up panels are constructed outside in the elements. If it's a tight job site location, makes it very challenging to do the work as well as storing all the materials needed to construct those panels. Um, this was very popular in the day. Um, it's, tends, it's still used, but it tend to be losing its popularity some just because of that, because the panels can get damaged. Um, the, the reason that you're using a cast-in-place concrete panel is, one, the speed of construction. 
So when you're using this in a tilt-up con concrete panel method, it can be, you can lose a couple weeks due to the weather. So when you're, that's when precast concrete has really stepped in because it doesn't matter what the weather is, it doesn't matter what's going on in the job site, you can still manufacture your panels and have them shipped out when ready. The big advantage or the only advantage I see in my eyes still, which is keeping tilt-up concrete panels in business, is that it does still give you some flexibility. If the design, something is just not right, door's in the wrong place, um, something is just not working on the plat where the building is supposed to be manufactured, it allows you some flexibility to, to move things around. If you had to construct a panel and take some walls and move them or put a window here or there, does give you that flexibility versus the precast concrete because when it's made, it's made. And these are just some examples of the cast and concrete panels. Um, and most of the time on the bigger ones, the schools, the hospitals, stadiums, office buildings, retail, that's how these are all being used. And it's become very popular. The construction speed is huge. And it just really works well with these type of applications. And that's why this popularity has become more and more of these type of construction. Here's a picture of how they're doing it. As you can see, um, as you notice, the, they're putting the brick in the grids. The brick are laid face down. Those are those little frogs, of course, I told you on the back of the thin brick in the pictures that I showed you earlier. So they're laying all the brick out. As you can see on that top, the guys on the right-hand side, if this is a brick blend, they're actually picking the blend and blending them in the walls themselves, not just taking brick and putting it, especially if you've got darker and lighter bricks in there. It's still just like a brick layer. It has some um, use of the masons. They have to, you know, mix the colors for you and blend them. And uh, the manufacturers also blend them in the boxes as well. But when you're doing a, a panel like this, it could be 20 and 30 feet long. They still have to use some care and to make sure the colors are blended correctly. Here's another one. This is a smaller panel. And doesn't look like it, but that brick is face down. Um, and that's how this panel is actually done. And then here we go. These are laid in those, uh, what they call form liners, and we're gonna talk in a few minutes on the different types of liners, but they're laid face down. And then as you can see, those panels are laid, the concrete is poured over the top of those panels. And that's why I was telling you on the different types of grading agencies, the FBX versus FBS. You can't go with a lot of flexibility on tolerances on these because if they do not fit in those form liners correctly, when you're pouring the concrete on top, it's going to allow that mortar to sneak around the front and get on the face of the brick and make it unsightly. And here we go. This is the panels. This type of form liner here, which we are going to dig into the types in a minute, but this is a plastic liner. As you can see, some of the plastic hanging off of it where it looks like it's almost falling apart. It's really not. Um, that form liner is kind of a one-use one. Once they use it, they use a pressure washer, and that's a wax coating that's on that brick. And the wax just allows if any mortar happens to sneak around to the front, that wax kind of keeps it, uh, protects the face of the brick, and you can take some of that mortar off when you take the wax off. Pressure washing it uh, with water, um, not too much in excess of about 200 degrees takes that plastic panel right off, and it takes that wax off with it, and then it cleans it up with the power washer. And then what you got? There's the panel. Nice and clean, very uniformed. Some of you guys, architects, can look at that and say, well, they didn't do a great blending job. They did okay, though, for the most part. You got some black brick in there and some reds, but uh, that's really going to be applicable to what you would have on a normal um, basic brick installation. You're going to have some colors that are condensed in there as well, but overall they did a pretty good job. Now we're going to talk about just looking at these projects a little bit. This is the casting place panels. Really became popular inside of um, when the parking garages really started jumping out to the forefront of some of these uh, multifamilies and hospitals installs. Um, that's really when 
this came into play because it really helped with the speed of, of these. And they didn't want just a concrete looking parking garage building. They wanted something to dress it up a little bit. I want to direct your attention though, however, on that right picture up top, um, see how that brick's kind of just hanging there? That would be difficult to do with a conventional brick. You can do it, but you'd have to have a lot of steel and angle irons and things underneath those panels supporting it. It'd also be hard picture framing that to look that way uh, using conventional brick. So what does it allow them to do? Really dress it up, drop those panels right in place, manufactured um, at a location, and they're ready to go. Um, very easy install. As I said a few minutes ago, we wanted to talk real quick about the type of form liners. The multiple use form liners, which is a polyurethane type with a plywood backing, pretty durable. The one time use is those plastic sheets I showed you just a few minutes ago. And then the one that's really become popular as of late is the flexible liner. Um, and I'll explain to you exactly why, in fact, that's become so popular. And here it is, the rubber liner. And it's actually what it is. It's, they're rubber. One, they can be used to 30 to 40 pores, which is, of course, they're more expensive going into the front end, but they can be used 30 to 40 times. And on a large scale project, that might not sound like a lot, but it really is. If you can do numerous pores using the same type of form liner. Two, it's rubber. So what it allows you to do Historically, in thin brick applications and in precast, brick looked a lot like tile. This looks a lot like you can use a tumble or simulated tumble brick or some, some brick with some texture, some different things that's not been historically used in thin brick but are being used now because it's giving some different aesthetic elements to the design of the buildings. The form liner is rubber, so when, it's, when your brick are pushed down in it, the rubber kind of forms around it and really makes a tight seal, which does not allow any of that moisture or the mortar to sneak around the front of the brick. And these are the plastic sheets we were talking about. That's kind of a one-time use. Very useful, very inexpensive. Um, you just you lay them out, lay the brick in them, but they are plastic, so it doesn't really give a lot of flexibility on tolerances. And you can't really force them in because they're plastic. They could crack, and you, if you have any type of a fail on that type of panel, and you're going to have um, water sneaking around the front and, and have a panel failure, which is going to be costly. Here's some pictures like I was just talking about, the different type of textures. You can see in the middle, that brick's got some texture in it. And if you put that in a standard plastic form liner, any of those imperfections in the face of the brick or on the edges, as you can see, is a, a specific spot where mortar can sneak around and get on the front of the brick. Also, when you're applying a wax um, coating to the faces of the brick, if you're doing that, like I showed you in a few pictures before, you're using 200 temperature water with a pressure washer. So that eliminates using any type of brick with a lot of texture on it or any type of a sand coating on it. Because when you're applying 200 temperature water and you're getting that, you're using enough force to get that wax off and that plastic liner off, any kind of a brick that's got coating on it, it's gonna take it all off. So that's when the rubber liners really even came into more effect because you, those rubber liners protect it. That, you know, and you, when those rubber liners come off, the brick are relatively pretty clean. You can brush them or use some very um, easy, cleaning to it and uh, allows you to use these different textures and colors that were normally not used historically. I'm going to go real quick. We're getting, getting close to being done, so bear with me one more minute. Uh, the PCI standard, this is what I was talking about. This is a specific standard that's applicable to the precast panels. And the reason being is this standard was created specifically for the precasters because what happens is the brick has to meet very stringent specifications for tolerances, for pull-out or tensile strength, for any type of um, tolerances, because what happens is, is when these panels are manufactured and they're installed, the onus is on the precaster. So if it fails or some brick are popping off or something happens with that panel, they're going to go to the precaster and the precaster is warning that panel. 
So the precaster's like, I need an insurance policy from the brick manufacturers or any of these claddings that if I use their materials, that it falls under a specific category. So that's when this PCI was created. Uh, there's been some pushback over time, but they're doing better with the form liners, which have given some leniency to the standards. I would guess in the next five years, a probably new PCI is going to come out with some a uh, little bit more lenient dimensions. You can't really take any um, considerations off of the tensile strength or the absorption because that really affects how the concrete that's poured and manufactured on those panels performs. But for the sake of really just tolerances and textures, that's probably going to be changing a little bit just to get some flexibility. Here's a picture too. This is what I think you would see in the, in, in the heyday of tilt-up panels and precast panels. Looks a lot like tile. And then you look at the one on the right, which has got a little bit of coating on it and some different colors. So it just gives you some flexibility on some aesthetics. Here's some other ones with the mock-ups. Uh, with anything, that's the beauty about using uh, this type of system because what you see on the mock-ups that are created by the precasters is very representative of what you're going to see on the buildings. Shows how it performs, shows how the concrete reacts with the brick, how the brick looks aesthetically. Um, it just gives you an overall really good feeling of what you're going to see when the building's constructed. I talked a few minutes ago. I'm going to touch base, and this is my closing part. Um, blending full brick and thin brick. This is another partner of ours, of ours which is Home Goods. They do the same, uh, but in different than Dick Sporting Goods, is Home Goods uses full brick and thin brick together on the buildings. And the reason they do it is just because how the building is designed. The columns are the full brick, and then on the wall claddings because there's some stucco that are used on some of these and some east applications as well as some stone possibly on where it is. So they don't redesign uh, the whole building just to accommodate a full brick and a thin brick working together. They design it that way where they can use different claddings um, and make these home goods all over the country. So again, I want to thank everybody for their time. It was, um, I know it was a lot of information to talk about. Um, I tried to skim over it, but get into the weeds with you guys a little bit on some specific things. But if you have questions or you're designing something and you want to just bounce some things off of me or any of our sales folks, Jake Bradford, who's um, with us from Meridian as well on this call, or reach out to your CSI guys um, to ask specific questions, they can find us. Um, and my contact information is going to be on here as well. Just to kind of tell you, help you through the process in what you're designing because what you design and what you want to see is critical. And I know you don't want to go back and revisit things um, if, you know, your brick doesn't, you know, if you're using a full brick and a thin brick and it's not out of the same plant, you're trying to match brick. There's a lot of upfront work we can do as sales folks to help you in your process. Authentic Brick at Bob Meridian, we have, a web, we have a brand new website, but it shows all our colors. We have a lion's share of different colors that are all on a made-to-order basis, but we also have a bunch of colors that are always in stock. And all different sizes, modular queens and kings, all kind of different sizes and utilities like I talked about before. Um, so they're really compatible with any type of installation as well. And we can help you with that. If you say, hey, I want a wall that's going to have utility brick on it, I need a thin brick. What system do I need to use or do I just need to do a fuel install? And uh, how do I guide the contractor through that process? We've been doing it a long time, and we can help you. Um, I've been in the business over 25 years, and Thinbrick is really uh, gaining more and more ground. And the beauty about brick is that it's it's a twofold because you have interior applications that's been popular with now, where it all started, and now it's really getting into some meaty large jobs with um, exterior as well. So we're we're excited. Here's my picture. Please excuse it. <laughs> but my um, email address is david.woods at meridianbrick.com. That's my local phone. So please do not hesitate to call me with any questions you have or um, just anything we can do to help you. And um, we welcome, look forward to welcoming 
anybody's feedback. And again, thanks everybody for visiting with me today.